when we talk specifically about universities, because that's a number of the examples you brought up, I'm mm-hmm. very uh, defensive of uh, academic freedom and of tenure. And, and I do have a principal position here. My, my view is that universities and the higher education and adult education, lifelong learning and so on, they're about the critical pursuit of knowledge. Yeah. And so much of what's happened over the reforms of recent you know, years and decades has been diminishing of that. I want to come back to that in a second, because I think it's really important within universities to raise the question of what well, actually who's restricting what can be said and what processes are. But we have to defend academic freedom and we have to defend tenure because these are the pillars on which uh, you base a free exchange of ideas. And you can actually have a, a, you know, an institutional position for radical voice within uh, disciplines in universities only because when campaigns come on from you know major media outlets to demonize radical academics um, to you know say that they're brainwashing your kids and they're you know teaching them all this kind of uh, anti-British stuff or whatever it is they're going on about it is only the framework Let's let's not kid ourselves in a moment when our universities are so cap in hand for money and so like determined to get corporate sponsorship. It's only the frameworks of academic freedom and tenure that save these people's positions. And like a lot of the radical academics that get attacked in the media, being totally frank, like I don't agree with them on lots of things, particularly postmodern academics who spend huge proportions of their careers attacking Marxism, socialism, the broader left. Like I don't agree with them, but you know, they're really important. And one of the reasons they're really important, and I think it's very important for us to defend them, is that they open doors. The number of people who go into classrooms with uh, radical academics who simply put different kinds of texts there, that doesn't mean that it's all left-wing texts, it can be right-wing texts, it can be whatever, but who are willing to put texts that are heterodox on mm. their syllabuses, those open doors that people then begin to walk down and, and think about it. I, I mean, I remember I had that experience with reading Foucault in university. I mean, I have no time now for Michel Foucault as a, as a social theorist, um, but the fact that I was given the exposure to reading Foucault was actually pretty important because it took me down into Foucault and then the critiques of Foucault and then questions of radicalism and then what had happened mm-hmm. in the post-60s period, the nature of the welfare state. And before the end of it, I ended up with, you know, quite advanced sets of understandings um, uh, that are that are running counter to mainstream understandings of the, of the 20th century. And it's because that door was opened. And so this is why we have to defend it. And we have to have a discussion more broadly about the universities as well, because the right is running a campaign right now about, you know, it's these wild students who are, you know, uh, trying to to get everyone sacked in universities um, with their no platforming tactics and whatever. And I'm not going to defend all of that. And we've just had a discussion about, you know, my belief that we shouldn't be calling for people to be to be sacked. I think it's a it's a a stupid uh, tactic and it's also in principle wrong. But. There is a a broader question here, which is I remember the post-crash economics discussion after the 2008 crash when students had to come together and demand that their universities include some more left-wing economists in Mm. uh, the, the economics departments, some more heterodox economists in economics departments, because what they were seeing happening in front of their eyes day to day on television no longer made sense against what they were learning in their in their syllabuses. Yeah. And that is actually the reality of British universities. Certainly the, sec- the sections of those universities that really have something to say about power, the politics departments, the economics departments, and so on, the history departments, these are not run by, in the vast, vast, vast majority of cases, by like wild-eyed radicals. It's a complete nonsense. If you have, and, and I have to say, you know, it doesn't mean, I, I read quite a lot of um, uh, 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 historians who are not left-wing, and I'm interested uh, in quite a lot of like, earlier social history i think that you know bbc's program in our time and whatever is a really fantastic um a, a kind of way to show off the interesting historical discussions that are going on inside british universities but it's a total canard right to believe that uh the british universities and their history departments are all being run by radicals they're being run in the vast majority of cases by pretty conservative mainstream establishment historians and you've got the odd radical voice here and there dotted around the place and it's the same with most other departments most other disciplines there are a few that have more sociology and so on have more but not that many and that's the reality of what universities look like yeah. it goes back to your point about money and resources and power because if you take UCL, for instance, recently, there's a bit of a fight there about adoption of the IHRA. Uh, now, you, you might think that's a, a, a good thing. They should adopt it. You might think it's a bad thing. They shouldn't adopt it. 
what I think is inarguable, I don't think I should adopt this my personal view, but that, that's kind of irrelevant because what matters is, like you say, if they get enough pushback on whatever decision, if, if corporate donors don't want to get involved, if people who are leaving their money, you know, sort of in their in their legacies and their will, uh, al- alumni who are sort of, you know, wealthy and giving them money regularly, if they start to say this isn't really acceptable, you know, to what extent is there academic freedom at UCL to adopt one position or the other? Because money talks. Because right now, universities, to an extent we've really not ever seen before, have been subordinated to profit and to capitalism, right? Fundamentally, you, you need money to exist, which 40 years ago, 50 years ago, wasn't necessarily the case for universities. Now, I'm not saying they were more enlightened 40 or 50 years ago, but like you say, the extent to which uh, power, resources, money inhibits freedom of expression, uh, freedom of intellectual curiosity, I think that's inarguable. And it's clearly only going in one direction. Absolutely. And it's actually the structure of the modern university, which is the most restrictive thing uh, in terms of setting the terrain for what can be said uh, and who can say it. Because the truth of it is that the modern university, like the vast majority of big and important research decisions are made with corporate sponsorship in mind Mm. at the very least if not are made on the back of what funding is available from who to be able to do what research which means that and this is not just in sciences i mean it it, it's not just in in the kind of hard sciences and natural sciences and whatever it happens in the social sciences to some extent as well um where questions are being asked over your ability to pursue things on the basis of what money is available and then who's making Mm. the decision over what money is available well in many cases uh, certainly you know we think of the the role that big pharma is now playing in universities and i know we have all this debate about the vaccine and so on we can get into a later stage but whatever you think about that outcome The process by which big pharmaceutical corporations can decide how huge amounts of university resources are are deployed is obviously a question of determining who's allowed to pursue what research and where. And that applies actually across the university. The big money is shaping what what you can pursue and what you can't. And you know what else is shaping it is the process of uh, university staff being casualized, university Mm -hmm. staff being underpaid for their work. Uh, and and the fact that academics are being forced into a hamster wheel um, to produce more and more and more kind of papers or publications in order that universities can rank in a certain way in uh, league tables in order that then those universities can attract more international sponsorship and more international students and more money in as part of a kind of commercial racket. And mm. those academics who are being forced into that hamster wheel, they can't actually uh, go about saying what they want to say. They can't go about, you know, writing on the topics they really want to write about or pursue, because what they're being forced to do is to simply churn out as many papers and as many kind of topics uh, as they can in order to get the university more points in this in this system. And the same, by the way, with academics who have got precarious working positions or casualized and whatever else. Well, what happens when they go and say something controversial? Their yeah. prospects of not getting higher their prospects of getting sacked and whatever are all much higher and the right doesn't want to engage in any of this debate it doesn't want to engage in any serious structural debate about what is influencing the modern university and what it's pursuing Uh, the left has to be able to step into that sphere and this is why the freedom of speech discussion is important the defense of academic freedom the defense of tenure we have to be able to step in and defend the idea of the university as a site of learning the idea of not just learning i have to say in the university setting, because the truth is we have undervalued other forms of learning. We've allowed this idea that a degree is just a stamp and your right to give you a professional job at some later point. People go on and get masters just so they can, you know, have a little bit more than a BA to get up the employment ladder a bit further. We have to break the idea of an education system that's totally instrumentalized towards the economy, the jobs market and profit at the end of the day and fight for one that's about the critical pursuit of knowledge, which is the old idea, the enlightenment idea of the university. And that should be ours to defend because actually the biggest threat to the Enlightenment idea of the university is the marketization of higher education, which is backed entirely by the Tories. But look, there, there are other aspects here. Um, you've ran, you, you mentioned the IHRA definition. 
the Israel-Palestine um, debate is a hugely important structuring debate over, over speech in universities at the moment that the right-wing free speech champions have basically nothing to say about. And it's mm. not just the IHRA definition, which I agree with you. Univer- I don't think it should be anywhere near universities. I don't think it should be anywhere near universities because you've got it immediately at that point, you are placing extraordinary limits on academic freedom uh, by using a different kind of context, you by using the context about safe spaces and whether or not you know there is discrimination and so on, you're infringing on academic freedom discussions, which should be being held actually on their own basis. You you raise the question so, of eugenics. Well, a good academics freedom uh, uh, discussion will deal with eugenics by saying, is this good principled decent research or is this pseudoscientific nonsense mm. and if a person is engaged in pseudoscientific nonsense that has no basis that they cannot prove well then i think you've got a much stronger case yeah. within uh, the a university of you know critical inquiry to make to make an argument against that person and that should be the way in which things are dealt with, not on the basis, for instance, of whether this person is creating a safe space or or or, or not for for students. And also, because the safe space concept is a fundamentally uh, misleading one. I understand why uh, it, it came about, but it's misleading. Uh, it it hasn't de- developed any kind of uh, position of power for the left more more generally. In fact, it's more often being used now, as we can see through the discussion over Israel Palestine against us. Um, and also to some of the prevent discussions. I'll come to that in a, in a second. Um, but it's also just not how uh, these things work when we say, oh, this or that is not a, not up for debate. Like, you know, a person's life is not up for debate. Well, you know, Irish people could have said that very easily in the 1980s and 90s. You know, our, our rights aren't up for debate. Well, I'm sorry, but they are. And they were. And we do need to win political institutional battles to try to defend them. But like when people were being shot dead for, for, for you know, demonstrating for civil rights, the, whether or not you say you, you, your life is not a subject of debate is kind of irrelevant. It is a subject of debate. And you've got to both be able to win the debate in the public sphere on the, that question over, oh, you know, your right to civil rights, as it would have been in that case. And you've got to be able to win the political battles that actually, you know, secure those rights in the in the real world. I think that's spot on. I, I just want to say, Ron, I think, you know, speaking as somebody who's, you know, British Iranian, mm-hmm. there are, you know, there's, there's a... a, a a dearth of um, of IR academics, more more so in the United States, who, who I think you know a lot of their presumptions and their you know their way of viewing the world and interpreting facts, I think is kind of is kind of racist. I think that. H- however, like you say, I mean, does that does that mean I therefore think that uh, schol- scholars in the kind of the realist school of international relations theory that they should because I don't really like them and I think what they're saying is kind of actually this is ki- kind of incontrovertible if you look at the kind of the the that pipeline between ideas and then the sort of neoconservatives which su- surrounded Bush in the White House, Bush Jr. You know, you could say, well, this is deeply, you know, unacceptable to, to, to people of Middle Eastern heritage, Iranians, Iraqis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And like I say, I, I, particularly in the university, you know, you can have these debates in various other institutions. I don't think the IHRA should be adopted by the Labour Party. I mean, that's again just my opinion. But at least with a political party, you can say. We have an executive. These are our values. We don't think this is congruent with our values. That's a different argument. I think you're quite right to make this difference. With the university, where it's more about a sort of, there's a meta debate going on where actually fundamentally the, the point of the organization is not that you're congruent with our values, but actually we, we have a, a range of views, which we kind of try, you know, we, 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 we try and enable and to inspire and, and hopefully that there can be productive productive agreements and disagreements. So I agree with you that freedom of speech, particularly in the context of, of education, I think is, is so important. And it's a little bit different to the arguments elsewhere.